Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the International Association of Chiefs of Police, IACP, and with support from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, I'm happy to welcome you to today's webinar, Starting Your Pre-Arrest Diversion Effort, Law Enforcement, Behavioral Health, and Community Together. My name is Karen Moline, and I'm Project Manager at the IACP for the Safety and Justice Challenge, which I'll talk more about a little later. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few logistical items about today's webinar. First of all, while we scheduled 90 minutes for the webinar, we wanted to be respectful of busy schedules. So the presentation is limited to 50 minutes with the remainder of the time for Q&A. The webinar is being recorded for future playback and a link to the recordings will be available soon on the Safety and Justice Challenge page of IACP's website and will be emailed to those who registered for the webinar. We will also have links on the page to the PowerPoint slides. Today's webinar is being audio cast via the speakers on your computer. If you do not have speakers or would prefer to use your phone, please use the number provided in your registration confirmation email or on the event tab located on the top left hand side of the screen. There are many people joining us today, so we have automatically muted the phone lines participants who call in to reduce the background noise. If you're using your phone but are not a presenter, please keep your phone muted. If you type in star six to unmute your phone, please retype it to remute your phone. If you need to communicate with IACP staff during the webinar, please use the chat feature to send a message to IT team. If you'd like to submit a question for the speakers at any time during the webinar, use the chat feature and direct it to Kristen McGee or organizer. And I think if you can see the um, box on the right-hand side of your screen, the chat feature is the long rectangular box um, at the bottom. And just click on chat. And then type in the message and then hit enter. For those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute to help us get a good count. Use the chat feature and type in the name of the person registered and enter the number of additional people in the room with you. We would really appreciate it. <clears throat> and finally, at the conclusion of today's webinar, you'll be asked to take a brief evaluation survey about the presentation. The information you provide will help us to plan and improve future webinars, and it's very much appreciated. ICP is a strategic ally in support of the Safety and Justice Challenge an initiative funded by the MacArthur Foundation to help participating jurisdictions across the country create fairer and more effective local justice systems and model effective strategies that can be adopted by others to improve their justice system for the benefit of everyone in the community. Our participation in the Safety and Justice Challenge is part of IACP's ongoing portfolio of efforts to provide resources and training in areas such as juvenile justice and pretrial justice reform on citation and move of arrest, pre-arrest diversion, and other strategies for improving public safety while enhancing community police relations. At this time, I'd like to thank the MacArthur Foundation for supporting this webinar, as well as our ongoing work in pre-arrest diversion with the PTAC Collaborative, a brand new undertaking focused on reframing the relationship between law enforcement, behavioral health, and the community, which you'll hear more about today. Our webinar this afternoon is on pre-arrest diversion, or PAD programs, specifically what leaders need to know before starting programs in their communities. Before I introduce our two speakers, we're going to launch a quick poll to assess how many of today's participants are currently implementing or developing PAD programs, by which I mean the type of diversion that occurs either without the threat of arrest or before an individual is processed or booked. So we're going to go ahead and launch that poll right now. And while we're doing that, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists for today. Today's presenters are leaders in the area of pre-arrest and police-assisted diversion programs and are currently guiding a national effort to organize experts in criminal justice, behavioral health, public policy, and research in an effort to understand and educate the field and public about pre-arrest diversion. Jack Charlier is the National Director for Justice Initiatives for the Center for Health and Justice at TASC. He specializes in crime reduction strategies and pre-arrest police-assisted diversion and led the development of the center's most recent, um, on the center's most recent 
publication titled Law Enforcement Deflection Frameworks, a Decision-Making Tool for Police Leaders. Jack serves as Deputy Chief of the Parole Division for the Illinois Department of Corrections, where he worked 16 years before joining TASC in 2011. While working for the State Parole Division, he specialized in building connections between parole and the community and bringing innovations from research into practice. He served as the Criminal Justice Representative for the Institutional Review Board at the uh, University of Illinois at Chicago and is an adjunct faculty member at several Chicago area universities where he teaches criminal justice courses around ethics, leadership, research, and management. He earned his MPA from The Ohio State University and a BS in Mathematics from the University of Illinois at Urbana. Greg Frost recently retired from the Tallahassee Police Department after a 30-year career working in law enforcement agencies in both sworn and senior administrative positions. He brings a unique perspective to law enforcement and criminal justice, having spent most of his career in the areas of research, policy, and program implementation. His work has involved a diversity of areas, such as nuclear security, counterterrorism, strategic crime analysis, domestic violence, mental health courts, law enforcement technologies, and public safety policy development. As a researcher and writer, Mr. Frost has published articles and book chapters on a number of criminal justice-related topics. He currently serves the criminal justice community as president of the Civil Citation Network and is a staunch advocate for effective reforms within the criminal justice system. Thank you both for joining us today. Jeff, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Karen, and welcome to everybody for today's uh, webinar. I'm going to uh, lead off with uh, two presentations, but don't worry, they're both uh, short. One will be on what you heard uh, Karen mention, which was the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative the PTAC Collaborative, so that you have an overview of that uh, new initiative. And then the uh, second uh, presentation on pre-arrest diversion, uh, what do you do uh, as leaders to get your effort and initiative uh, going? So a few things before I start. Now, whether I present uh, en vivo, live, or on webinar, uh, I'm not as worried as uh, about getting through all the slides as much as I'm to make sure that you learn something. So please, we have substantial amounts of time, 40 minutes set aside for questions. Please ask questions. Please challenge Greg and I. Uh, we want you to learn something and walk away uh, from the webinar uh, with one or two things that you say. I didn't know that before and that's useful. Uh, we'd like you to share with us then what you're doing uh, based on a poll. Uh, nearly half of you, 45 percent. Uh, are in fact doing some type of effort in the pre-arrest aversion realm. So we'd like to hear from you also. Um, and then finally, just uh, again, another thing for me is I don't read the slides, so um, I'll touch on a few things on each slide uh, and then move on. You all have access to these uh, slides so that you can look at them if you don't catch it the first time around. So with that said, let me go on and get started. Uh, as Karen mentioned, there's a, a new entity on the national scene called the Police Treatment and Community uh, collaborative, the PTAC collaborative, or just a collaborative. And let me move. Can you? Uh, there we go. Advance slide. All right. Um, so the PTAC collaborative, and if you hear me say PTAC or collaborative, that's all this was just recently founded, right? So in April of 2017, following an inaugural summit held at IACP in March of this year, bringing together national leaders from the research, behavior, health, law enforcement, uh, and community realm to have a conversation about what is it we're going to do about this emerging, newly emerging field of uh, pre-arrest uh, diversion. And so the PTAC Collaborative uh, formed out of that. The name uh, PTAC Collaborative comes from this relationship that must exist between police, treatment, and community for pre-arrest diversion, police diversion, uh, police-assisted diversion to happen. So while we don't know a lot yet from the research and evaluation side, about uh, pre-arrest diversion. What we do know so far, however, is that police treatment and community must, in fact, work together. You can see on the screen right now our mission and our purpose. Uh, the mission is about widening, widening behavioral health options for uh, law enforcement uh, diversion to take place. So whatever you might be doing now, you might have a diversion pathway that takes you, for example, only to mental health. We want to widen that to substance use. Uh, if you're doing substance use, we want to say throw in mental health. If you're doing both of those, we'd say put in social services. So that is the mission, right? To widen the pathway for uh, law enforcement to have a variety of options available to it that best address the needs of the people that are being encountered. 
Uh, our purpose for the collaborative, uh, you see that on there. Main thing is this is national in scope, right? So what we're looking for is everybody who's doing this work, whether you come from the law enforcement world, the behavior health world, the research world, or the community world, we would like you to be part of the PTAC collaborative. We're driving down all the lanes, no single lanes. Why? Because this is still a newly emerging uh, field with within the intersection of behavior health and law enforcement. And of course, the cornerstone of PTAC is the idea that we're agnostic, right? This is the word uh, that we use. We're agnostic. Right now, we just don't know enough about what all these different efforts are doing, which ones in the end are going to prove to be successful and have the impact that's desired. And so what we say is, look, whether you're doing civil citation, STEER, Angel, Arlington, Ort, LEAD, and whatever other names you have for the initiatives you are doing, right now the PTAC Collaborative is going to say, let's do them all. Let's look at what we need to understand about these through evaluation and research, and we'll figure out what it is that's going to come out of the wash and what's going to be the ones that we should promulgate to the field. But right now, we're not ready to push, and nobody should be pushing any single method or way to uh, go after it because it's really about what's the problem that you have or challenge that you need addressed what does your local situation look like? And what's your behavioral health capacity, right? What's your ability to actually put in place the behavioral health interventions that all these pre-arrest aversion initiatives rely on, behavioral health interventions of some sort, mental health, substance use, trauma, social services, housing, that's the intervention. And so capacity to do that intervention is critical. Here's our five strategic areas, and as I said, we invite anybody uh, who is on this webinar today or listening to this at a later date to join in any of the strategic areas. You can see them uh, up there. Uh, Greg Frost heads up informing the field, uh, and our next call for that is coming up uh, in May. And again, if you are interested in joining the collaborative, we'll get you those dates and the call-in number. Um, I lead up, but we really do it collectively, the leadership team, which is the big idea, big tent that you see up there. Uh, think Tank is the behavioral health folks that we have on the webinar and uh, watching this down the road. Uh, that's really for them. Um, and then, of course, research community and community. Community is an interesting one because this is a really, really important part about pre-arrest aversion that otherwise might not get touched on. The idea that the communities uh, that are uh, going to be impacted by these efforts should be part of the conversation. So by community, we mean neighborhoods. Uh, residences, uh, residents, citizens uh, who live uh, across the United States. So again, these are five strategic areas and you're welcome to join any of them that you'd like and you can join multiple ones uh, including uh, leadership. So that's just a very briefly what the PTAC Collaborative uh, is, our mission, our purpose, uh, where we're headed. Here's our next steps. You can see it on the screen if you'd like to sign up just send me an email. Uh, our emails are used then and distributed only within the, uh, the Collaborative join one of the areas, stay informed about what's going on, and then uh, share, uh, we're going to share with you from ICP the PTAC Collaborative one-pager, uh, and that way you have in writing uh, more information about the Collaborative as well as you can share that with colleagues in the behavioral health, law enforcement, research community world, and invite them to be part of the Collaborative. So if you've not received that already, you will shortly uh, from uh, IACP. Finally, on on uh, the PTAC Collaborative, we do have our inaugural uh, conference coming up. You can see that up here. We don't have a location yet. Tentatively, the tentative date, of course, is March. This is going to be wide open to everybody. So the March 2017 inaugural pre-arrest deflection summit that was hosted at IACP was really reaching out to the folks uh, who we already knew were in this space. But the March 2018 conference is going to be wide open to everybody uh, who's able to attend. So we'll get you more information on that. And again, if you sign up for the Collaborative, and did nothing else, didn't participate in the strategic area, didn't comment on anything, that'd be fine. You'll get this information uh, too when that uh, pushes out. So that's the collaborative. I want to get uh, into the next part of this. Uh, let me see if we've got any questions here first. Okay, good. So let me move to the next part of the uh, webinar today. Oh, if you want to contact us, uh, there is our information for both myself and for Greg. And you can get in touch with either of us. That's totally fine. Okay. So pre-arrest aversion, right? Pre-arrest aversion. Again, from the poll, uh, nearly half you, 45%, are already doing this in some way, shape, or form. So that's good to see. And as I said up front, really would like 
to hear from you also when we get to our uh, very long uh, Q&A 40 minute time period which was designed uh, so that you'd have a lot of chance uh, to ask questions but also for us to listen. But pre-arrest aversion uh, when uh, we understand it and kind of look at a lot of different ventures it's about public health as the intervention to better public safety. Public health as the intervention to better public safety. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But let's open up first with what is the difference? There we go. Slides are going a little slower on my end, so I apologize for the delay. Okay. Um, what is the difference when you hear kind of the terminology that's out there? And on this slide, what you'll see is some of that terminology. And so what's the difference between it? The difference is that uh, different folks have developed different ways of understanding what pre-arrest aversion is, and so they've come up with different terms. This is very normal. It's fine. I don't know which terms uh, you use, but you should see yours up here. If you don't, by the way, send that in to uh, ICP, send that to Greg or myself, and we'll add it to the slide. Uh, the differences are probably more just about understanding, as I said, where their initiative started, where they thought it was going, what effort or initiative they adopted from somewhere else, and they took that name. But the reality is the field has not yet settled on a term for pre-arrest aversion. Um, so deflection, the very top one that you see there, uh, is one uh, that I know uh, is out there. Uh, all the other ones, pre-arrest, that's the one used by the PTAC Collaborative. Um, Greg, who you're going to hear with civil citation, used as police assisted diversion, uh, and that's fine. The point is that you have a term, you have an understanding of what it means uh, for your effort, but all these are about the same thing, pre-arrest diversion, as Karen said, where no charges are filed so the person is never booked, right, is never booked and it goes no farther into the criminal justice system. Now, pre-arrest diversion differs from other types of diversion, right? So diversion is this word that's used throughout the criminal justice system and it has a certain meaning. But pre-arrest diversion is unique in that because it's it's at the very, very front end where community is, where law enforcement is, behavior health is, and behavior health and community are not attached to the criminal justice system, right? Law enforcement is, but those other two aren't. There are some important distinctions between pre-arrest diversion um, and the word diversion in general. So the first one, of course, is that pre-arrest diversion is about moving away from the justice system without having entered it. Now, we're not getting into the legal uh, kind of line here. Uh, if a police officer arrests someone, puts them in the car, takes them down to the station, uh, and uh, does pre-arrest diversion there, that's fine. We're good with that. Uh, we understand that uh, street stops happen, and you know, legally that's an arrest, right? We're not talking about that. We're talking about whether or not, uh, and this is the first difference between pre-arrest diversion and diversion, whether or not you get booked in and sent down uh, deeper into the justice system. And by being booked in, you might bond out right away. That could well be, but you've been booked in, and that's the difference. Once you hit that point of booking and beyond, you're no longer in the pre-arrest diversion realm, but you might be in diversion from another uh, type of diversion, like pretrial diversion or prosecutorial diversion. But those are different. So pretrial arrest diversion begins as a difference by saying we're moving you away from the criminal justice system and you never entered it. Next, pre-arrest diversion is really guided by behavioral health, but built around criminal justice partnerships because it's the behavioral health intervention in the community that's going to make the difference. Now, by the term behavioral health, substance use disorder, drug treatment, mental health, trauma, and we also extend it, even though it doesn't say it on the slide, uh, that's just for space, we also say social services and other types of activities that different jurisdictions might include on their pre-arrest diversion, uh, such as housing, for example. So pre-arrest diversion is behavior health guided, and that is a difference from uh, the word diversion when it's generally used in the rest of the criminal justice system. And finally, pre-arrest diversion, as I said, is a public health solution, right? That was the opening to this section. It's a public health solution to better public safety and represents what I call nine-tenths of pre-arrest diversion is the intervention of treatment, is the intervention of mental health, is the intervention of social services. Law enforcement plays a critical role, of course, that one-tenth, because without that one-tenth, the handoff, right, the handoff to behavioral health, to treatment, to social services would never happen. That's critical. But the interventions that we're talking about are going to be done uh, by folks in the community, in the public health, behavioral health, treatment, and social services world. 
Now, there are two types of pre-arrest diversion, and I like to say, really for jurisdiction, if we're going to design this for your jurisdiction and you're going to take a look at what you're doing, ultimately, you should get to both of these. You should end up doing both of these. So one is called prevention of pre-arrest diversion, and the other one is called intervention pre-arrest diversion. So prevention is there's no charges, there never were any charges, and there's not going to be any charges, right? So this is the type of situation where someone walks into a station um, or an officer sees someone on the streets and just encounters them, has a conversation with them, and realizes there's something here that a pre-arrest diversion program uh, could be helpful for. So pre-arrest or prevention uh, pad, prevention pre-arrest diversion, again, no charges, nothing nothing regarding criminal activity, but there is a behavioral health issue. We can identify that issue, and because of that, the officer then is able to uh, send that person, send that person off to treatment or to social services. This is the most common type of diversion that's going on in the United States, and it's also the easiest. And what I mean by that is because there's no charges, the police really are in this role of just, hey, I've, I've got you here right in front of me. I'm going to hand you off to someone else in the community community and then I'm done, I go back in my squad and uh, go back on patrol or back on uh, uh, whatever it is that I was doing uh, before I encountered you. The least or the, the one that's not done as much is intervention pre-arrest diversion and the reason is because charges exist in this uh, in intervention diversion and the charges are either held in abeyance or in the case of, for example, Greg's Civil Citation Network, um, an issuance, they're issued as a non-criminal citation, right, non-criminal citation. And so both of these put together, if you think about it, right, uh, both of these really then would cover the range of things that your officers uh, would encounter on the street. Folks who have a behavioral health issue, but for which there's no charges, not going to be charges, and I need to get them off the treatment. And folks you encounter for whom there could be charges, but by department policy and training, and sometimes a legislative framework, I'm going to uh, put those charges in abeyance. They're not going to be booked. There's going to be some kind of report written, but they're going to be put in abeyance. Or we're going to go to a citation, but it's not citation lieu of arrest. It's citation lieu of arrest with treatment. That's the trick here. So when you hear Greg talk about civil citation, there's tr treatment attached to it. That, that's part of the condition, if you will, of this uh, of this intervention effort. So those are the, the two types of pre-arrest diversion. And as you think through what it is that you want to do, I would ask you to consider to make sure, first of all, which one are you? doing or are you doing both and if you're not doing both because most are not uh, we can work with you and figure out a way for you to do both because again you're going to be getting at then the range of the population that your jurisdiction is going to encounter so what are the promises of pre-arrest diversion and when I say the word promises I'll get asked about this what I mean is essentially why do this what's the point of adding this in so you can see all the ones that are up there. Uh, obviously, reduced crime leads to pack, right? We understand that. There's a, a reason that we all do the work we do in criminal justice, and it's about crime, reducing crime and about uh, public safety, right? Um, all those other things up there matter. They're all important. I want to highlight just two, the two that are in green. Uh, first, uh, building police community relations. Uh, I say jokingly as a national expert in pre-arrest diversion, and when I go to the restaurant and tell them that, they still charge me the same amount on my check. But I think one of the uh, things that we're going to see as pre-arrest diversion expands and grows across the United States is we're going to see the impact in a good way, in an improved way, on building or rebuilding police community relations. I make no assumptions, by the way, that in your jurisdiction, police community relations are good or bad. All I say about pre-arrest diversion is that it will support police community relations getting better. So if they're really good, they're going to get really, really good. If they're not so good, they're going to get better. Um, why? Because the citizens and residents of communities will see the same with squad cars going up and down the street. They uh, will see the same encounters going on on the street in the homes. But what's going to change is an hour later or a few hours later, that person who was um, now encountered by law enforcement will call back to their mother, their father, their spouse, their kids and say, hey, you know, the police took me away, but I'm in drug treatment now. I didn't go to jail. Or, hey, you know, the police uh, came into our home and uh, my son's not here. Where is he? Ma'am, uh, we realized he was a good fit for a pre-arrest diversion, and uh, he's agreed to be uh, in uh, stable housing that we're able to put him in, and he's going to get mental health services. And if we see enough iterations of that over and over and over in, in the communities in which you work, the citizens and residents will begin to see something different happening 
with the police and they'll begin to see their loved ones and their neighbors who are suitable for pre-arrest diversion, right, who are suitable when appropriate for pre-arrest diversion, getting the help that everybody knows is actually needed versus the intervention of arrest when everybody knows that there are times that that's not the solution. And everybody gets that, right? Law enforcement gets that, the family members get that, the community gets that, the behavioral health system gets that. And so we'll see, hey, there's times that, yes, we're still gonna be arresting um, and sending folks into lockup in jail because that's where they need to be. But we've got this other part now uh, through our partnership on uh, other tools that we have available to us and people will see that over and over and over and that will, over time, over time change the dynamics of how people will view the role of police uh, in the community. And then secondly, and this is really a, an extension of that, is reducing the burden on criminal justice to what are public health and social challenges, right? So we can say that the police have been asked to do things in the United States over the many years that are outside of their mission, outside of their training, outside of their funding, outside of their policy. Dealing with folks who have substance use disorder, uh, drug use, abuse, and addiction, but really just need treatment. They haven't really done anything criminal or it's low level, nonviolent, minimal public safety risk. Um, yet the police are called to that scene and what do they do? They've been asked to deal with that. Mental health, trauma, homelessness, uh, juvenile uh, situations involving youth and juveniles not getting along with their parents, needing to go somewhere. Well, that's kind of out of the realm of law enforcement. And yet that is where the burden has been placed. The blame has been placed and much of the negative press gets placed. And there's a lot of good stuff going on in law enforcement. So why not bring in the behavior health realm in the United States and let them do the job that they in fact are trained for, are ready to do, are excited to do by having law enforcement move those folks over to them in a partnership, in a collaborative way, right? So that the folks get the treatment they need, the support they need on the behavior health side, and law enforcement can go about doing what it does best, which is finding crime and keeping us safe. So you can see all the promises, but I always highlight those two because those might not be as obvious. They're also a little bit longer run and down the road. Okay, um, next up uh, that you're gonna see here really kind of gets into the initial part about, um, let me see if I, I've got a question. Okay, so I thought I had a question coming in there. Uh, the initial part uh, about how it is that we go ahead and start in a jurisdiction, a pre-arrest diversion initiative, or if you are doing an initiative, however you arrived at doing it, um, have you asked yourself these questions? So if you have not doing one, and I saw I'm doing this from memory, I think it's about 22% are not doing one right now, um, and then so many are in development, or if you're doing one, did you ask yourself these questions and if not stop and do it now if you have it underway still I'd say the same thing stop and do it now so who are you considering uh, doing uh, for pre-arrest diversion right and this really comes down to what's the problem you're trying to solve or the challenge you're trying to address now I totally understand what it means to take something new and want to do that for your department and in your community I get that if you don't have CIT for example um, you don't have civil citation you want to put those in totally get it, rock and roll, go do that. But the question is really from a good leadership standpoint, what's the problem I'm trying to solve by doing whatever this is? What's the challenge I'm trying to address? And when I talk to folks around the country on this, it's my lead question. And if I don't get an answer to that, then I know that we have to kind of go back to that and say, well, what, what chief are you uh, dealing with right now? What's the issue? Because the different types of pre-arrest diversion efforts appear already to have different things that they're getting at, different problems they're solving. Um, what does success look like? We all know that and we live in a day and age, of course, of data. Um, so you understand that implicitly and being part of the MacArthur uh, Grant Safety and Justice Challenge Grant, of course, uh, data is absolutely required. So you get that. Um, who are you going to divert? And that's really related to what's the problem or challenge uh, that you have because that's the population. Remember, there's two types of pre-arrest uh, diversion. So prevention can hit one population, intervention can hit another, but they might not always overlap. There's definitely some overlap, but they might not. Who are you going to divert? When will you divert them? That means at what stage uh, in the encounter will you divert them? Where will you divert them to? Um, and how will you divert them? Of course, you can read that slide 
uh, uh, up there, but these are the questions, the standard things, why, what, who, when, where, how, that you have to ask before you start, and you have to have an answer because the type of pre-arrest version that you choose should be based on the answer to these questions. So in looking uh, at pre-arrest aversion in the United States, what we can see is the uh, main difference between them, the main di difference between them is what's called the pathway for treatment, right? How does someone go from law being in law enforcement hands to uh, being in the hands of behavioral health? And if we do that, we, we come up with these five pre-arrest aversion frameworks, and I call them the pathways to treatment. You can see the name of the frameworks. This is one slide that I I'll do a little bit of reading on, so uh, I know I said up front I wouldn't read the slides, uh, but I'm going to do a little bit of reading on this because this is new. This is something new to folks. So Naloxone Plus uh, is the name of one of the frameworks. This is the framework you want to use if the challenge or problem you have is opioid crisis in your community. These frameworks are uniquely designed to address uh, opiate overdose as a response to that, right? And the trigger, the pathway is uh, the identification of a person who's at high risk for overdose or who has already overdosed. Active outreach, that's another framework. So this is where law enforcement, uh, the trigger for this is law enforcement reaches out to folks that have been identified as being in need of treatment or possibly being in need of treatment and says, hey, we've got a treatment option available to you. That's called active outreach. Who's doing the active outreach? The police. The pathway to treatment isn't wait for you to overdose or isn't that we've identified you as an opioid user. It's that we know that you are using drugs and we're going to offer you, uh, we're going to offer you substance use disorder treatment or drug treatment. But the police are actively outreaching. That then becomes a pathway to treatment. Again, the pathway being how do you get from law enforcement to behavioral health? Self-referral. Self-referral means what? The, the citizen self-refers into the police station, and for some uh, variations on this, self-refers by walking up to uh, a cruiser or a police car on the street or seeing an officer on the street and goes up and says, you know, I need help, I need treatment, I need mental health, I need housing. So the pathway to treatment is the citizen, the resident, self-refers and volunteers and identifies themselves as someone in need of assistance. Officer prevention referral, this goes back to prevention pre-arrest aversion prevention, which means there's no charges, there never were any charges, there are not going to be charges. The law enforcement officer, the police officer sees an individual and through a triage, whatever that triage looks like, um, eventually will be, by the way, evidence-based uh, screening type of triage. Uh, right now, the, those aren't able to be in place. They are a little bit, but they're not able to be in place because we don't have a lot of that uh, research done uh, yet. But officer prevention is where essentially the officer does a triage and says, hey, I've encountered you, I've, uh, I'm, there's no charges, but I have an option for you because I can see that you might be in need of uh, mental health treatment. We all get they're not going to speak that way. I'm just using that for the webinar. So officer prevention referrals where the pathway becomes the officer doing a behavioral health triage and moving them along. And then finally, the final pathway is officer intervention referral. Intervention, again, pre-arrest aversion means there are charges, but they're held in abeyance or moved to civil citation or issuance of citation with treatment. Not just citation in lieu of arrest, that's not pre-arrest aversion, that's something else. Citation in lieu of arrest with treatment is, I can do charges, but instead we're going to go to a citation, but you got to do treatment, um, or we're going to hold the charges in abeyance. So again, it's the officer is the pathway uh, with charges present. So those are the five frameworks. It is around these frameworks that you build your pre-arrest aversion initiative, and these are the real distinguishing points between the different efforts that are out there in the United States. Okay, we're getting to the end. Just a few more slides uh, to go here. Uh, these are the examples uh, that you know by what I call brand names. Some people use the word models. We don't know if they're models yet or not because evaluation isn't done. All the pieces that uh, might be part of it, we don't fully know yet. Uh, kind of what is the right combination of things. So I use the word brands. If you use the word model, that's fine. But just keep in mind when I uh, say that, with the exception of civil citation, which actually has a good amount of research on it uh, in certain areas, the rest of these we just don't have enough yet to say definitively whether this thing works really well or does not and who it works for, when it should be used, and who should use it. But you'll recognize uh, what's in bold up there, with the exception of two of them, a DART, which is the actual name for uh, this is Lucas 
County, Ohio. It's a name for their uh, opioid uh, opioid overdose prevention initiative. The the DART is actually the name of uh, that effort. These are often called ORT models. I say just ORT, which is opiate response uh, opiate response team. Some version of that. So if you're running anything on opioids and focused on that DART, which is an ORT model or ORT brand, is just one of them. There's lots and lots of those sites. Uh, the other one you might not recognize up here is STEER, which is Stop, Triage, Engage, Educate, and Rehabilitate, run by Montgomery County Police Department. Uh, for sake of being transparent, we helped develop that, uh, that brand, uh, and so I just want to put that out there. But on PTAC Collaborative, going back to that in the opening, we're agnostic. So when you think of these or you think of the frameworks, the issue isn't that uh, I'm going to tell you, um, hey, I want you to do angel or I want you to do lead. The issue is what is the problem you're trying to solve or the challenge you're going to address. And if you notice underneath each item in bold, you'll see the different pathways to treatment that these represent. And so the uh, pathway to treatment with the wrong or going for a problem that, that it's not meant to work for will not work, right? Will not work. It's not designed for that. Um, so bottom part, what's your purpose, right? What's your purpose? All right, there we go. Sorry about that. Again, the slides are moving a little bit slow. Let me back up one. Okay, and then finally, uh, in closing here, then I'll turn it over to my colleague, uh, Greg Frost. Um, we have a pre-arrest diversion framework decision-making tool that's a, a and yes. this, I'm sorry, this is Karen. Can I interrupt you for one minute? Did you yes. want to launch a second poll about asking people about their um, diversions? Actually, thank you so much for that. Excuse me, thank you for that. Let me back up to slide one second, Karen, and let's do it right here. That's excellent. Thank you. We've got a poll that we want you to take right now. So we asked you up front um, who's doing pre-arrest diversion and, and based on the different brand names that I put out on this poll if you can indicate then for those of you who are doing pre-arrest diversion or are in implementation right now right it's it's putting in place or uh, in going into development which of the uh, brands that uh, you see up here most closely approximate your effort so if you can go ahead and please select one of these uh, right now And you might, you're not going to be using the same names, but you'll know, hey, you know, this is Angel. We're not, we don't call it Angel. We call it something else, but we know that this is Angel. The citizen self refers, for example. We're doing opioids, and that's our focus. So that's going to be DART, uh, which is really an opioid response team approach. So go ahead and answer uh, the poll question now, please. All right, so let's actually, Karen, if we can hold it here for one second, let's see what we've got. Um, so civil citation and uh, active outreach, so Arlington, right? Uh, uh, that's, they're both at 19%. The opioid response, at 14%. Um, that's probably the nature of where your jurisdictions are in the United States, because while we hear about the opioid crisis, um, it is not uniform throughout the United States. Uh, Angel at 5%, okay, and then the most common one is uh, lead. Uh, the lead brand. Okay, good. This is really interesting to see, actually. So thank you for the, thank you for reminding me, Karen. That one's on me. Thank you. Okay, let me uh, head to the end here, and then as I said, turn you over to my colleague Greg. So there is a tool um, that uh, exists that we have uh, that we work with jurisdictions on, and this tool is comprised of 16 pre-arrest diversion characteristics. And again, it's about putting the pieces together as we understand them now to get to the best fit for your effort, for your jurisdiction specific to that versus bringing in a brand, no matter what that brand is, uh, and mismatching it to the problem uh, you're trying to solve or the challenge that's at hand. And the final slide is just an example of what two of the characteristics uh, look like or talk about. So one is treatment capacity. Um, this really is, by the way, what I call the holy grail pre-arrest version. If you do not have in your jurisdiction sufficient behavioral health capacity and intervention, social services, uh, for your effort, you'll never be able to scale it up. And I would tell you, you got to figure this out before you even get going. Because if you 
realize your demand will be 500 people a year and you can only have capacity for 30 of you a year, I'd say you got to really dig down and do the work to figure out the capacity issue. But this is just one of the 16 uh, and then of course local experience is another one of the 16 characteristics that we'll look at and put together a, a pre-arrest diversion program that uniquely fits your jurisdiction the problem you're trying to solve, the challenge you're trying to address, keeping in mind the best pathway to treatment that works for your officers, and keeping in mind the behavioral health capacity of your community. And with that said, um, you got my contact info already, but with that said, uh, for those of you who are underway under pre-arrest diversion, take a look at this. We've got more that we can do with you through IACP. Um, and see, I'm underway, I gotta go back and ask these questions, we're in development, let's ask the questions, or we're thinking about what to do, we're not acting yet, let's ask these questions and figure out where we should go. And that's it, thank you very much, uh, and I'm looking forward to your questions and interacting with you uh, at the end of today's webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the end because we promise to keep the, the actual webinar to a certain length for anybody who had to leave at the end. Um, so we'll go right on to Greg Frost, and thank you so much, Jack, and um, we do have one question from somebody, and so we'll hold that. And you guys, please use the chat feature. People have started to use the question feature, and if you look at the very bottom of that box, there's a um, line for chat, and that's a little bit easier for us to use than the questions feature, so try to do that. Um, thank you so much, and go ahead, Greg. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for joining this webinar. We're, uh, we're finding that this is an area that uh, is of great interest uh, around the country, uh, growing interest, and uh, we're just very glad to be able to, uh, to provide some information that uh, hopefully you'll find useful. Uh, I'm going to talk about this kind of from a, a, a ground level perspective. Uh, when we started our program here in Tallahassee, uh, I was uh, a senior administrator with the Tallahassee Police Department, so I, I went through all of the sausage making uh, on how you build community collaboration, how you uh, go about kind of taking the steps that, that Jack just talked about. Um, so I just wanted to kind of uh, shine a little bit of a light on some key areas, uh, hopefully generate some, uh, some questions. Um, and uh, again, hopefully provide you all some information so that uh, if you're considering this or if you have a program, it, it might be useful. Um, one of the things Jack mentioned at the very beginning of this was it, this, this is such a new field that we're still wrestling with some of the very basic terms uh, to include what do we call this thing. Um, and when you dig down a couple layers, you even get to the point of what is a citation? So let, let me talk a little bit about that. And this is from the again, this is from the law enforcement perspective. This is this is the, the this is the chief, this is the sheriff, this is the guy, lady on the street at two o'clock in the morning. So citation is used uh, in all kinds of different ways. Uh, there's a citation in lieu of arrest. Uh, here in Florida, we call that a notice to appear. Uh, where the person is is released on scene, they're they're never really taken down to the jail to be booked. <clears throat> the bottom line on that is they still have an arrest record, um, and it's that arrest record that is really really critical to what happens to that person in the future. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Even the term civil citation uh, is used differently. Uh, civil citation. When, when we talk about it in terms of a diversion program, uh, civil citation includes uh, behavioral health intervention. Um, but in, in some jurisdictions, particularly in the state of Florida, uh, a civil citation has become what they call a, a ticket. It's basically a ticket and a fine, uh, usually for some sort of uh, marijuana-related uh, crime or a, a city or county ordinance violation. Uh, it's basically a speeding ticket. The, there is no behavioral intervention attached to it. Um, so that, that's kind of the starting point. So when you hear me talk about uh, civil citations and, and diversion, that is the community collaborative partnership between 
law enforcement and a local behavioral health agency. Uh, that's really where we're seeing some very, very encouraging results uh, by providing that intervention um, on, on future criminal behavior uh, and providing for some human dignity for that person uh, if they're suffering from some, from some sort of serious addiction. Um, let, me, let me touch on that for just a second as well because terms kind of get mixed around here. Uh, the term treatment, uh, the term intervention, uh, the, the term case management. Um, the way I'm going to be talking about this is for treatment, that is the, uh, that's more the deep end. That's the, that's the very serious uh, substance abuse, substance addiction type treatment. Uh, for us, intervention is more of a, uh, it's a behavioral health, uh, you know, let, let's get this person into a, uh, a behavioral health specialist where they can be assessed, um, or you can just kind of look under the hood. You know, what's going on in their life? You know, they don't necessarily need more sophisticated or advanced treatment, um, but just some behavioral intervention to, you know, kind of tweak them a little bit, get them back on the right path. Uh, Jack mentioned social services. Uh, that's also a term with case management. Uh, you know, these people come into a program and they're going to have multiple issues, whether it's substance abuse, mental health issues. Uh, you know, this is just somebody that had a financial problem and, you know, they're having some real emotional issues that led to a criminal act. Um, you know, they need more than just, uh, okay, you're, you're fine. Well, they may need housing. Uh, they may need some direction towards a potential uh, training, educational, uh, job opportunities. Um, so that the case management, the social services piece of this uh, is very critical as well. So with that said, uh, let me move over to my next slide, if this will advance for me here. I don't seem to be advancing. Here we go. So the starting point, if you're, in a, if you're in a law enforcement agency, and I'm assuming most of the folks on this webinar are, are with law enforcement, um, and Jack mentioned this several times, and I'm just going to mention it again, the absolutely critical starting point is what, what is your problem? What, what are you trying to address? Um, is, it, is it a community-oriented policing program that you're looking for to help the community relations? Uh, are you looking strategically uh, to reduce the workload on your jail? Um, are you looking at alternatives to arrest for, uh, in, in the Civil Citation Network program for first time low level misdemeanor offenders? Are you looking for something because your community is having an opioid crisis? Um, so that's, that's the first step. The next step is, is truly an honest local assessment. And, and when I say honest, that is that is key. You've really got to be able to lift the veil and look at the the key players that you have in your community. You've got to look at the resources that you have in your community. Um, are you going to implement a program that requires funding? All right, who's going to fund it? Where are those funds going to come from? Um, do you have the political support? Um, so that that's where that honest assessment comes in. Um, and, 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 and that can be very difficult because obviously there, there's a, a number of various agendas uh, when you start dealing with these kinds of uh, transformational programs. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit later on, on some of the community challenges about that. Um, one of the things we found here, and I think other communities want to attest to this, is who, who are your champions? Who are the people that really, really want to do this, see the value, and, and really are willing to take a lead role. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, here in Tallahassee, our program started uh, not because we did something in, in, in the Tallahassee Police Department. It was actually a behavioral ser services, behavioral health agency, uh, a nonprofit group here in town uh, that started the, the whole effort. Um, so who, who those champions are and, and what field they're in uh, is absolutely key. There's a lot of players in, in the criminal justice system, um, and, and I'm preaching to the choir, I know, for those of you that, that are in criminal justice. Um, but there's, there's really five 
very key players, uh, at least from my experience, police chief, the sheriff, prosecutor, public defender, uh, and whoever your chief judge is. Um, one, one of the things that, that we have found is that one, one or two of these folks, um, if they potentially disagree with it for whatever reason, um, can, can completely shut down the effort. Um, so part of your first steps uh, really needs to be each one of those five individuals who hold that office, where are they? You know, it, that's all part of that honest local assessment as to what what is the environment right now within our community that we're trying to do this. Uh, community resources are absolutely key. And, and Jack mentioned this as well. Do you have a behavioral health agency uh, that has the capacity? Uh, do they provide the services? Um, the, the program, again, uh, here in Tallahassee and, and, and LEAD and, and ANGEL, and most of those are dealing with uh, substance abuse. Um, you're going to encounter people with mental illness, mental health issues. Uh, is your behavioral health agency in your community able to handle both, or do you need multiple behavioral health agencies involved as, as local partners? Your local elected officials, the city county commissioners, uh, are absolutely key, uh, particularly if funding is an issue. Uh, they can either help support that effort or, uh, you know, sometimes they're able to reach out under the auspices of a, of a, a larger government entity uh, and bring in grant funding uh, to at least get you started. So uh, those elected officials are, are very, very important as well. Uh, Whatever group represents the, the minority groups in your community, uh, here in Tallahassee, that's the NAACP, uh, they had some very strong concerns and we started our program. Um, so uh, any of those groups uh, will need to be included in that, that local assessment as well. Uh, and the media, are they going to be able to help uh, explain to the community uh, how this program is going to be a good thing? Um, you know, some, some jurisdictions, the relationship between law enforcement and the media is good. Uh, others, it's, it's very, very strained. Uh, so again, these are all groups and individuals uh, that need to be brought into the loop uh, as you're just beginning to develop um, what, what, what are we trying to do here? What is our problem? Uh, and what kind of uh, model is out there uh, that we think uh, we can replicate or modify? Uh, to meet our needs locally. Let me drop down to the next slide. And again, I apologize for the for the delay here. I'm not sure. I think Jack probably messed it up. That would be that would be my thought. So here's here are some of the community challenges. Once once you get a chance to uh, start reaching out, you know, when you start having these discussions and these meetings. What, what are some of the challenges you're going to face? Um, immediately, you're going to find the institutional resistance. Uh, that's, that's not what we do. That's not my idea. Um, you may find that a particular uh, uh, individual is, is resistant to it. And, and, and again, I, I, I might step on some toes here, um, but I think real-life examples uh, are great information and, and, and great things to know about where, you know, where other folks have, have had issues. So every jurisdiction is different. So you know, if I'm stepping on anybody's toes here, I apologize. Um, but a great example that I've run into around the state of Florida when I've talked to individuals uh, about setting up pre-arrest diversion uh, is with the state attorney's office, uh, maybe call the district attorney in your area. Um, uh, and including some of the court functions, clerks of the court. Because one of the things that, that, that's happened is our criminal justice system is funded by people being arrested. Uh, the criminal justice system is almost incentivized financially to arrest people. So if you're talking pre-arrest diversion where that person is never booked, uh, they're never processed for prosecution, they're never processed through the court system, there's actually a financial impact of that. Uh, at least here in Florida there is, and I'm, I'm assuming most other states are probably funded the same way within their 
uh, uh, criminal justice systems. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, uh, Council of State Court Administrators put out a whole report on how the court system should not be used as a revenue center. Um, so you're going to find some resistance there. Okay, what, what you're proposing, Chief of Police or Mr. Sheriff, uh, is going to impact me financially. So you, you've got to be prepared to, to address that. Uh, at a very practical level, law enforcement operates 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Behavioral health agencies usually don't. Uh, so again, based on the model that you're talking about, if, if you're dealing with uh, either a prevention or an intervention model that's designed for someone who may be having some kind of uh, uh, substance abuse crisis, opioid over, uh, uh, overdose, addiction, uh, maybe it's not worthy of needing to go to the emergency room at the hospital, um, but do you have a, a behavioral health agency that can, can do a warm handoff at, at 2 o'clock in the morning? Uh, again, it's all part of that, that op, the uh, uh, honest assessment of, of what you have going. Funding sources. Obviously, that's a big yes. question. Anytime? Yep. Yes, ma'am. It's the great interrupter again. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're rapidly approaching one hour. Um, yep. I was wondering if you would mind talking a little bit about selecting the right behavioral health partner. Sure, kind sure. Of, I, think yeah, I, thank I, you. I think I can do that. Yeah. The, uh, at, at, you know, a lot of that is going to rest with um, what resources already exist within your community. Uh, coming out of the law enforcement field, one of the things I have found uh, is that there are some very uh, large, sophisticated behavioral health agencies that are for-profit. Uh, they cover very large areas. Uh, there are smaller, um, I hate to call them mom and pop, but there's, there's some very small, typically non-profit behavioral health agencies. Um, one of the things you'll find is any, any time there's money involved, um, now you're going to have procurement issues. Do you do a request for proposals? Um, how, are all, how are all of these things uh, going to be done as far as selecting uh, your behavioral health partner? And, and that selection is absolutely critical. Um, what we have found is that it's a, it's a little bit easier when you're building initial support uh, to deal with an agency that is a nonprofit. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't very good uh, for-profit agencies out there that, uh, that can certainly be very valuable partners in your efforts. The, you know, one of the things we're finding is, is it's the capacity, uh, it's, it's the funding, what are the services that they can actually provide based on the problem that you're addressing. Um, and I think as we move forward, uh, one of the things that the behavioral health team that's a part of the PTAC collaborative uh, is talking about is as these programs continue to grow, uh, the need for some kind of, of licensing or certification uh, process for behavioral health agencies so that, you know, if, if there is a group that wants to be part of a, a law enforcement support model, where they're providing their behavioral health services, that there is some sort of, of, of standard of care uh, that as a law enforcement agency, uh, you can look to that as, okay, this, this is a group that, that understands what we need uh, and we can probably do business with them. Let me touch on another one just real quick, Karen, if you don't mind. Uh, I know we're running just a tad over here. Um, you know, the, the research on this is, is very, very critical. Uh, anytime you're building something new, the first question you're going to be asked is, well, how, how do we know if it's successful? Uh, and that's going to depend on how you define your outcome measures. Uh, it's going to rest with you're going to need um, some kind of, of academic or research uh, resources uh, so that they can, they can uh, uh, partner up with you to look at the various data. And my slide's not moving, Karen. Are we are we having are we having an issue here? There we um, go. The your your program, the, the data side of this uh, is is absolutely critical. Who has the data? Where is it? How is it coordinated? Um, there's an entire uh, uh, a technological infrastructure that can be needed uh, so that you can monitor and track who's who's in the program, who's been through the program. 
there's a number of uh, uh, privacy requirements, see just data security when you start dealing with arrest data and some of the criminal justice records. Um, so again, uh, that is a huge part as you're first standing up a program, you need to address the how, who, who's going to do the research, how's it going to be done, and what are our technology requirements uh, to make sure that the various folks who need the information and the data uh, are part of it. And I was just going to bring up a couple of real quick slides here, Karen, tail end, that just show uh, what we've done through our researcher at Western Carolina University. Um, but again, my, my slides aren't forwarding, so um, if you want to go ahead and take over from here, oh, here we go. Because our program, let me just talk very briefly, because our program is focusing on first-time low-level misdemeanor offenders, uh, some, of the, some of the outcomes that we were obviously very concerned about was what are the demographics? Who, who's getting this? Uh, and again, that was driven by community sensitivities to uh, minorities, equal access, uh, equitable uh, issuance uh, of the civil citations for referral, what types of offenses uh, are being, uh, uh, what are the offense categories for the citations being issued, um, and then finally our biggest outcome uh, that we were looking at was recidivism. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the people that we were referring that the behavioral health intervention that they were receiving actually decreased um, their rearrest rates. Uh, and as you can see from this particular slide, uh, our researcher partnered up with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement here, uh, and we were able to look at statewide uh, arrest data, not just here locally, but uh, have the people that have been through the program been arrested. Uh, anywhere else in the state of Florida on any charge by any agency. So uh, again, that, that research, uh, the definition of your outcomes, uh, and are you going to have the, the technology infrastructure uh, to support your data needs. Um, and with that, uh, I appreciate your time, and Karen, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. Um, we almost succeeded in keeping it to an hour, not quite the 50 minutes, but that's okay. So we have had a couple of questions come in. The first one um, is, how is risk determined at this point? Is there a tool that you recommend? And I know that there is at least one um, project, the one out of Montgomery County, SCARE, and that's actually the one that Jack worked on. So I'm going to let Jack take this question. Sure, it's a, it's a great question. I can't see who asked it, but it's a great question, and it's really one of the ones where in this field of pre-arrest diversion, um, we're going to uh, take a few years before we get to the point of really being able to ask it uh, based on risk or risk and need specifically uh, at this point involving law enforcement. The rest of the criminal justice system has lots of research on this area going back about 25 years, and so here's the answer I can give you right now. Number one, there are no tools specifically designed for use by law enforcement yet in this area. However, um, Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Eau Claire PD, Wisconsin, and Montgomery County Police, uh, which is a county level police department in Maryland, both are using the proxy risk tool. Now, without the time available here, proxy risk is a static risk indicator consisting of three questions. It's normed and validated and it's been around for a long time. It's got really good research on it. And it's three questions that give you a screen on uh, the risk level that somebody presents as risk to reoffend, not risk to public safety. I, we don't have the time to get into this, but it's risk to reoffend, not risk to public safety. Uh, and it is, as far as I know, and again, I'm learning about this stuff all the time as we encounter new initiatives going on around the country. It is the uh, the only risk tool that's being used. Again, three questions. It's called the proxy. You can Google it or we can send it to you. P-R-O-X-Y, proxy risk tool, uh, and it can be administered very easily by an officer uh, on the street. Now the field uh, will begin to develop tools based on what the rest of the criminal justice system does around risk and actually risk need, which is the full real uh, uh, panels that are needed, all the panels on areas that are needed to actually get at this question, uh, but those will probably be a few years off uh, at best.
Thank you, Jack. Um, and I know that Charleston, South Carolina is developing, I'm not sure if it's been implemented yet. I know that um, there's an officer from Charleston um, listening to the webinar, um, and if she wants to send a chat and let us know if their tool is being implemented yet, I'd really appreciate it. Um, yeah. The second question that came in, and um, it's actually the only other question that's come in so far, so if you guys have any questions, please send them to the chat, and at this point, if you want to send them to the question, that's fine. Um, the second question is, are there any programs um, for special populations, and right now, um, specifically for women, that you know of? I don't know of any that target, uh, I shouldn't say target, that are focused on women. Uh, there's about 260 of these initiatives around the U.S. that we know of, which means there's probably a few hundred more, but not many. I don't know of any, though, that are uh, focused on women. However, LEAD, uh, uh, the original LEAD out of Seattle, as you know, um, targeted or focused on um, prostitution, which is not just women, obviously, but focused on prostitution. Um, and so obviously encountered, uh, more likely than not, uh, statistically more women than men in its effort. Let me, let me make a real brief comment on that as well when you're dealing with special populations. If it's a, uh, if it's a prevention model, um, then I think they're, you know, I, I'm with Jack, I've not heard of any, but certainly uh, that would be a very viable approach on a prevention. Uh, I think if you try to do this on any kind of a uh, intervention level uh, where there are associated criminal charges uh, that are being held in abeyance, uh, I think you might run into some legal issues uh, as far as uh, you know, one one group of people over here, you know, potentially could have their charges held in abeyance. Uh, if you're not part of that special group, then you're going to go ahead and be arrested. Uh, I think you run into some some legal problems there uh, on an intervention model if you start trying to apply it just to uh, special populations and not equal uh, across uh, your entire population of your jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, how do you secure buy-in from law enforcement in your community for front-end diversion? Well, right, you want to start off? Yeah. Jump, let, let me jump into that for, for a minute. You know, the, the biggest thing is, is information. What, what, what are you trying to do with this program that's going to help the officer on the street? Um, you know, cops are trained, I was trained, everybody that ever wore a badge was trained, that, you know, you're there to enforce the law, you enforce the law, you arrest people. Uh, you know, until recently, officers had basically two options. You either let the person go, once you once you built probable cause, uh, you either let the person go or you arrest them. Um, I think once officers understand that there is now this third option, they welcome it. Um, because they're the ones that at, at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, here, here's a person that is under, you know, under the right circumstances, you know, my best action for them really is not to arrest them. Um, that's just going to do more harm by giving them an arrest record. And there's an entire body of research out there that talks about the lifelong negative consequences of, of having an arrest record. So what, what do I do with this person? So we're actually uh, providing something that I think a lot of officers have an appreciation for. Um, it, it gives them another tool in the tool belt as long as they understand this is this is the end result. You know, this this person is going to be held accountable. You know, this is not a get out of jail free card. Uh, here's here's what's going to happen to them uh, once they once that referral is made. Uh, the other piece of this, uh, as we've had a number of dis discussions around uh, juvenile civil citations and even to a certain extent adult, uh, is officer discretion. Uh, I think as long as the officers feel like uh, I've got a third option, I understand it, I've been trained on it, and I've got the discretion uh, to use it. Uh, there's been some movement here in Florida on the juvenile uh, civil citation, which is the same thing. It's a referral over for uh, behavioral intervention that it would be mandatory uh, for officers to issue those. And there's an incredible pushback. So I think the buy-in. Uh, is is the, the biggest thing is 
information. Make make sure they really understand that if if they refer someone rather than arrest, here's what's going to happen. Uh, you know, most most cops are in the motive. They want to help people. Um, you know, they they don't they don't just want to go out there and cuff and stuff. You know, they're they understand that their objective is is very similar to behavioral health. It's it's changing someone's behavior. Um, and this just gives them another option rather than arresting them uh, to actually give them something positive in, in the form of some behavioral health intervention. Thank you, Greg. Um, this question was a follow-up um, from the question about um, programs designed specifically for women. And the follow-up question was, given the description of the charges you mentioned, would these types of offenses have a low re-arrest rate even without the pre-arrest initiative? Karen, the question is uh, specifically to women or in general, um, certain types of offense? Yeah, it was, it was the follow-up um, to the question specifically for women, and so I think that the follow-up question is about the charges that you had mentioned for um, pre-arrest diversion. Okay, so this is actually a really good question because it links back to risk. Um, the likelihood of someone's uh, the likelihood of someone's risk to reoffend is not based on the charge. So don't look at the charge or what's called the holding off offense and say, based on a gun case or a prostitution case, they're likely or not likely to reoffend. You can't answer the question that way based on research. You have to look at the individual person and the factors substance use, uh, stability, how they think about things, and their background to get at that answer. So um, someone who's a, a female uh, might have a very high re risk for rearrest, and another female might not, but they might be both on the same charge. Uh, so that's the way to get at that. It's not to say what's the charge. Um, so Karen, I, I want to say something more on the risk question, because I think I may have missed answering part of it. But I want to see if there's other if there's another question first. If not, I want to go back to the risk question real, real quick. You go ahead. Okay. So this idea of risk, again, and when I use the word risk and the research that's coming from the rest of the criminal justice field uses the word risk. Remember, it's risk to reoffend, not risk to public safety. That's an important difference. The other thing is for the law enforcement world, the word risk means something different. And for lay people, citizens, risk means something even more. Uh, even more different, right? Um, and so just understand it when we talk about risk in the context of a pre-arrest aversion or whatever is the terminology you use for it, uh, I only said that opening slide about all the different terms for this. Um, understand that what we're trying to get at is, is the individual before you based on uh, totality of circumstances, right? It's kind of like probable cause, based on totality of research-based uh, variables and criteria some of which are static, which means they're in the past, they're not going to change. Some of which are dynamic, which means they are changeable um, in a person's life. I use drugs, now I don't use drugs. I used to think that uh, being a criminal is good, now I don't. That it is that combination of understanding those things that allows us to actually get at a risk level. Just looking at someone's offense or the reason you arrested them, or even all their background, all their previous arrests, does not get you a risk level within the terminology of how the rest of the justice system uses it. Um, or how when these tools come in, they will be used. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is uh, police officers, law enforcement officers, like everybody else in the criminal justice system, want discretion on making decisions. This is a really, really important part of pre-arrest diversion. But so do judges, so do parole officers, so do wardens. Everybody wants discretion and guards it. The tools, the risk tools, tools and eventually the risk need tools, which is the combination of those two is what really gets you your understanding of risk of an individual, um, are about ensuring that the decision that's made is based as much on research as possible. They're not about taking away discretion. So if I as a law enforcement officer doing pre-arrest diversion look at Greg and say, well, I can run his background and see how many times he's been arrested and for what, um, I make a, a judgment about him that might get me to one decision. But if I run his background and I have a set of very simple tools used on the street like the proxy risk tool or maybe uh, the uh, Texas Christian University drug screen which is just 11 questions um, or the uh, another tool which is three or four questions, I now have much more to make a better decision on. I'm not losing discretion 
I'm making a better decision. And that's an important thing uh, that will come into play more and more as pre-arrest aversion starts going down the road of saying, hey, officers, we want you to use the tool to make the decision. Oh, you're taking away discretion. No, we're helping you make a better decision by giving you information that you can't otherwise know or kind of process um, on your own without having a tool to help you, right? So that's a really, really important thing. Uh, if you're considering risk, need as part of your pre-arrest aversion, please get in touch you know, with someone, contact us so that we can help you with that. If you have it in place, please make sure you're using a validated tool and it's actually being used in the decision-making process. So we mentioned Eau Claire, Wisconsin, they've got some good data on about three years of use of the proxy risk tool. Uh, Karen also mentioned STEER, which is Montgomery County, Maryland. Um, and they're at about a, right over a year of data on using proxy as well as the CAGE. The CAGE is a three question drug screen, whether or not uh, this person should uh, go on for further uh, assessment for drug treatment. Um, so I wanted to throw that in there to kind of give a little bit more of a complete picture on risk as it relates to pre-arrest diversion. You should be doing it. It should be part of your effort because that way you can target the right population and link them up to the right interventions. You should be doing it as early as possible. And your behavior health partner, your uh, social service partner, they should be verifying and confirming the uh, results of the screens done by the officers. If the officers aren't doing it, then your behavior health or some other entity must be doing risk need uh, screening to get the right assessment uh, of who this person is standing before them. Yeah, and I, I wanted to add one thing to that. First of all, there was a question. Um, what are the three questions on the proxy tool? Um, the first question is um, the current age of the individual. The second question is what was the age at their first arrest? And the third question is how many arrests have they had? So those are the three questions on the proxy risk tool. Um, but in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, they've actually compared the data that they've gotten from the proxy risk tool and compared it to their longer risk assessment that they do um, at the jail or at pretrial and um, compared those data. And um, those data have been really priceless to them. And so the other reason for using um, that risk assessment tool by law enforcement is to have those data. Um, and I think they've been really valuable to them. Um, right now, those are all the questions that we have, but I have a couple more that I think um, are valuable. Um, what skills do officers need most in order to be successful in deflecting and diverting? So um, say that you don't have a risk tool, but, um, but a lot of jurisdictions are using pre-arrest diversion without having that tool. Innately, what do you think are the most important skills for officers to have? And I'll go to Greg. Well, it ties into the, uh, I think, the overall culture and training that, that a particular department uses. Um, there's a lot of departments that are using the CIT model um, for people with uh, 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 mental illness issues, mental health issues. Uh, we're seeing more and more training on de-escalation, uh, which is improving the officer's communication skills under, under a crisis-type situation. Um, so I think there's some, some natural evolution uh, that's going on for how patrol officers, you know, the, the guys and ladies on the street at 2 o'clock in the morning, uh, I think there's some natural evolution of how they're being trained uh, that plays in very, very well to uh, the sorts of things that you're going to be doing if you're dealing with someone and whether you're you know, considering, am I going to arrest this person? Uh, or am I going to uh, uh, divert them over to uh, some kind of behavioral health intervention or treatment? Um, again, it, it comes down to information. Um, I think officers need to know uh, some of the differences between, uh, you know, what's treatment, what's intervention, uh, what are some of the things I need to be looking at as far as, you know, what I'm seeing in this person. Um, but it's, it's not complicated. Uh, cops on the street are very good at reading people. Uh, they're very good at, at understanding uh, what's going on with this person very quickly. It's what they do. Um, they're, they're trained to do it. Uh, most of them have very good experience and, and very, very good people skills. So um, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it's almost an innate factor uh, of, of policing on the street 
and I, you know, I, I think that just by virtue of a uh, little additional training, um, I think the officers are very, very willing and able uh, to uh, to participate in these kinds of programs. Karen, I'll, I'll, I, Greg, spot on as always. I'll throw in two things. One, just emphasizing one point he made. It is important for officers to understand uh, enough about um, addiction and how it works on the brain, the neuroscience of addiction as a disease of the brain, to understand treatment, to understand mental health, um, and to understand how the organizations that they are the pathway to sending them off to work. Um, and so I want to emphasize that point or add a little bit more detail or color to what Greg said on that, just as it is for the behavioral health partners to understand police. And this gets to the second thing I wanted to say, which goes to the name of the PTAC collaborative, the Police Treatment and Community Collaborative. The officers, the behavioral health workers, both at the line level, the leadership level, and uh, the community partners must learn, it is, it is a skill that can be learned, how to collaborate to do this decision making together. That's critical to the success of very complex problems that pre-arrest aversion is dealing with, right? So if you had a mental health issue and you've had it since you were eight and you take medications and you now get stopped at 32, the complexity of that intervention uh, is beyond any of those single players to deal with on their own in pre-arrest aversion. So they must learn how to first communicate, then cooperate, then eventually collaborate, both individually and as systems. And so those are the two things that I uh, want to stress again, just reinforcing what Greg said uh, uh, on that. Thank you. Those are good points. Um, what is the officer's role after handoff to a case manager or a drop-off at a triage center? And are there any programs that include continued officer involvement? Oh, and um, I'll, I'll go to Jack. Okay, um, so that's a two-part question. Say the first one uh, again, uh, what, what's the officer role after drop-off? Yes, what is the role yeah, okay. after a handoff to a case manager? Yep, okay, so let me say this. Uh, this is all, all new, this, you know, uh, the PTAC collaborative and pre-arrest version is new. It's no more than six years old, uh, a little bit, little bit older than that. So, so we don't really fully know yet. What we do know is there's a variety of efforts going on around there. So um, think about it this way. What is the problem you're trying to solve, the challenge you want to address? What does the officer need to be doing, if anything, um, after drop-off? So uh, there are some efforts out there where the officer is involved in what would look like a traditional case management approach where they uh, would follow up uh, with the behavioral health provider and behavioral health provider or social service entity will follow up with them, give them status briefings on the cases, share information, say, hey, Jack's gone. We haven't seen him in two weeks, uh, can you go find him for us? Um, uh, and then sit down and actually make decisions with the behavioral health provider, uh, with the community, whatever the, the community entity looks like. Uh, and there's others where it is just, especially like the crisis models, tend to be more just a drop off, drive up to the brick and mortar building, uh, put the person in the building, kind of like an ER and uh, you know drive away and go back to duty. So it varies. The point isn't what's done. The point is is what's done related to what you needed to be done in terms of the problem that uh, you're trying to solve. So um, that you have to understand. So what's my problem and should the officer be involved? What is your capacity, your staffing uh, to do that? Case management is extremely time intensive and requires officers like going to court to be around at different hours that might incur overtime. Um, so I mentioned the question by saying, again, it depends. We don't really know yet. What we do know is it drives back to where you're trying to go with this thing. Um, four ones where the officer should be involved are probably ones where the person using validated risk need tool scores out as being uh, moderate risk and of higher need because what the research tells us is those folks at least initially need much higher and intensive, uh, I'm going to use the word supervision, even though the police don't su supervise people, uh, monitoring and attention to what they're doing in community, at least initially. Whereas if your initiative is around solving things that involve mostly low risk, low need people, which you might not want to be doing a lot with anyway, and I'm using the risk need literature here, uh, your officer involvement might be very minimal. And then the other part of this is, well, what is the nature of the involvement? Uh, it might, it should be focused on things like very pro-social uh, interactions, very motivational, 
uh, interactions supportive because what we know is that a lot of really supportive comments for people goes over much better and tends to move people farther than uh, negative uh, comments do and you think about your own life in that. I can't get more into it because our time's short, but it's a great thing to explore. Again, on your effort, have you thought through this in advance? Have you looked at the research that we know of that guides how this should occur? What was the second part of the question, Karen? Um, are there any programs that include continued officer involvement? Okay, so um, the answer is yes. Um, and so I answered to the question, Steer, Montgomery County, Maryland does include officer involvement. The uh, case managers uh, who work in the districts and the police cars go out on their own, uh, do the follow up with the officer, will meet with him or her again, uh, will give them updates. The officer will say to the case manager, hey, come in the car with me, let's go find Jack. Uh, I know we uh, put him in steer three months ago, let's go see what he's up to. And of course, the case managers will know. So, Steer has that built into it. It is not the only effort that does, just where we are time-wise, it's the easiest one for me to uh, recall. Uh, LEAD, of course, has a collaborative model and elements of that, so if you're doing a LEAD effort, you have some elements of that uh, built in also. Uh, Greg, do you want to uh, take a stab at this also from uh, where you are? Yeah, I, I'm not familiar with any programs that specifically uh, mandate or require that the officers stay engaged, but one of the things that, that we've toyed around with is uh, a restorative justice model um, where depending, again, depending on the, the totality of the circumstances with this person, uh, restorative justice has some real value. Uh, and there may be uh, a point where as, as a model is being um, you know, modified for any particular jurisdiction, uh, restorative justice could be a piece of it where uh, if, if a crime has been committed, there's always a victim. Um, so using the restorative justice process where you've got a you know, neighborhood accountability board or something along those lines, the officer could very well be a part of that. You know, particularly if you've got a, uh, a town or a city that uses community-oriented policing and you know, that's my neighborhood, that's my cop, um, they could be engaged in that kind of effort. So um, I think the nice thing about how these kinds of programs are being looked at. Lots and lots of flexibility. Uh, we're only limited by how creative we want to be at this point. Well, we are nearing the end of our time. Um, I want to let people know that the one pager that Jack was talking about will be um, on our web page as soon as we get this webinar up. I'd like to thank our speakers today, Jack Charlie and Greg Frost, for their time and expertise the MacArthur Foundation for their support, and everyone in the audience for joining us today. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentation and will join us for future webinars. For the IACP, this is Karen Moline. Have a good afternoon.